Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. I know everyone is extremely busy with midterms, but we really do have a phenomenal talk for you all today. Um, my name is Stephanie Arzate. I am the International Development Roundtable Coordinator. Um, for those of you who's your first time being here, the SICE International Development Roundtable is a high profile speaker series where leaders and practitioners within the international development sphere address our students, faculty, and the broader community on trends that are shaping the field. On behalf of the International Development Program, I would like to thank you, welcome you to today's event with Ms. Andre Simone, President and CEO of Finca Impact, and she's also a SICE alum. So please help me in welcoming her home. <laughs> So Finca Impact is a global provider of responsible financial services. Finca's network of 20 community-based banks offers responsible and affordable loans and saving products that empower low-income women and men and control of saving their financial future. During her talk, Ms. Simone will, talk, will be talking about the promises and pitfalls of, inter of financial technology. Financial technology is a powerful tool that can potentially change millions of lives. However, Will this revolution reach those who are in need of the resources the most? Today we will explore the role of technology that the role of technology can play in expanding financial inclusion. She will also be discussing the challenges looking forward as companies like Finca talk, try to reach some of the most unbanked populations. So please put your hands together for Ms. Andrea Simone. So I'm actually mic'd, so I don't have to stand here, but I do have my notes that I am going to refer to occasionally. So first of all, thank you all so much for showing up. It's very nice, especially with the midterms. That's a lot of pressure, I remember. Um, I know this is supposed to be lecture style, but I think that sitting in a lecture where only one person talks for a really long period of time is pretty boring. Um, and I would really prefer it if it were interactive. So um, I would really like to encourage you guys, if you have questions along the way, to just stop me and raise your hand or comments. Because the truth is that um, even though I've been working in financial services for a really long time and in development for a really long time, I certainly do not have all of the answers. Um, and I think that particularly right now when we're talking about financial inclusion, um, there's a lot of important debate to be had, so um, I hope that you guys come forward with your ideas. I actually have taught a class for a long time at Georgetown, and I have to be honest and say that my students always ask me what sounds like the most benign of questions um, that forces me to reconsider something that I have accepted as a truth for a really long time. So uh, you have an important role to play in making sure that Finca doesn't screw up going forward. Um, so I know that I was billed as talking about fintech, and I could talk to you guys about just fintech um, for a really long time. Um, but I want to make sure that we have a foundation around financial inclusion, because um, the goal for us certainly is not a pure fintech play, but really it's how do you achieve financial inclusion, and I'm going to go even a step beyond financial inclusion, because I actually think that financial inclusion in and of itself can be a really bad thing. <laughs> um, financial impact and how you support people in really building their wealth um, is what we should be aiming to achieve. So let's start off by talking about um, why poor people need access to financial services. So why do you guys need access to financial services? Not that you're poor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was in your seat once, so I do appreciate that. Um, why do you, okay, so how many of you took out a loan to come to school? Okay, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, how many of you have used a credit card to buy groceries? Mm. Um, how many of you have used credit to pay for a special event, like a wedding, for example, or a ticket home to a funeral? Um, how many of you have insurance? I, I hope all of you raise your hands. <laughs> um, and how many of you have some form of savings? Right, okay. So the vast majority of poor people have all of those same needs, right? They need to send their kids to school. They need to buy groceries. 
They need to send money to somebody who's living in a different city. Um, they have to pay for funerals. They have to pay for weddings. They have to save some money. But most of them and don't really have a way to do that. So if they need to generate cash, they kind of have three choices. One is they can sell the only assets that they have. So in the case of the poor, the assets that they have, and as a general rule, <laughs> um, are the only productive assets that are, exist in their life. So we're talking about the cow or the goat or the chickens, um, which means that they are selling the only means of income creation that they might actually have. That's one piece. They could liquidate whatever meager savings they might have. Um, and you'd be surprised at actually how effective poor people are at saving, uh, despite the fact that they have little income. Um, or they can borrow that money from a moneylender um, at pretty exorbitant rates, right? And you guys know that microfinance has never been cheap. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about microfinance, but a lot of what people are borrowing at, it could be like a 200% annual effective interest rate. Um, which is pretty hard to get out from under, um, particularly if you're very poor. So the premise of making that, those financial services available to people um, is to try and really give them a variety of tools that they can use. Traditional banks have not wanted to serve the unbanked. Does anybody know why? Okay, so they're not profitable. Can we do, let's drill down on that a little bit. So. Why would somebody who's relatively poor not be so profitable? Okay, so the risk and trust is one of the biggest factors, right? And if somebody doesn't have any assets that you can take as collateral, then your, your concern about them repaying you is very, very high. So that's always been a huge hurdle. There's a second hurdle, which is that um, the transaction sizes are really, really small, right? So the cost for a traditional bank of processing a small loan and processing a big loan is basically the same. Like when we're talking about really large loans where you have to go do a considerable amount of due diligence, then the cost increases dramatically. But for most financial institutions, they're like, there's no point in me processing a $50 loan because I have to go through the same amount of paperwork and the same amount of effort in order to do that, but I'm gonna earn very little interest on it. So that's a big factor as well. Um, then there's the socioeconomic factor, which is particularly in the developing countries that I work in, banks don't want poor people in their branches. <laughs> They're dirty and they smell funny and they come from the countryside. Um, and so there is a barrier there that is a socioeconomic barrier where people don't feel welcome and in fact maybe not welcome, right? Um, further, there's a transportation issue because th the truth is if you're going to go deposit $1, you're not going to pay $1.50 to ride a bus for three or four hours to get to a bank branch in order to be able to do that, right? So instead, you take that dollar and you put it in a tin can and you bury it in your backyard. Um, and the branches aren't going to be built out in the countryside because guess what? It costs a lot of money to build a bank branch, particularly if you're a regulated institution. There are so many barriers to why people didn't get access to financial services. So then microfinance came onto the scene. And yeah, of course, I'm going to talk to you about microfinance because that's what I do. But, um, but microfinance was kind of um, really meant to be a test case initially, right? To say, actually, we believe that people who do not have a significant amount of income can, in fact, repay their loans. And the truth is that historically, the default rate on microfinance has been amazingly good. I mean, good in the sense that overall it's about a 3% default um, on the portfolio. And you compare that to a traditional bank in the United States that has a lot of consumer debt, it's around 12%. So microfinance has been incredibly effective. That's partly because people haven't had any alternative, right? And if you know that the only place that you're going to be able to get a loan um, is this microfinance institution, you're less likely to default on that loan, right? So that's part of it. And as competition has increased, in fact, we've seen higher and higher default rates in areas where there's been competition between microfinance institutions. But nonetheless, microfinance has done pretty well. Um, I feel like we've done, done nearly as well as we should have. Um, and I want to explain the model to you a little bit because 
it's going to get us to why technology is potentially the answer. So the traditional microfinance, who knows about microfinance, by the way? Okay, so it's a little bit of a mixed room. So for those of you that know a lot about micro, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but the basic model of microfinance um, is, is predicated on a couple of different things. So first of all, historically at least, it used group methodologies. So it would bundle groups of clients together. Um, and it bundled groups of clients together partly because there was a social fabric that came together around that, right? So you could have people who would cross-guarantee each other. And essentially what that means, for those of you who are bankers, is that you transfer the risk from the bank to the group. So um, that's a pretty interesting model in a lot of ways because traditionally when a bank makes you a loan, they're the one that takes the credit risk, right? But if you put a group of people together and you say, you are responsible for guaranteeing each other's risk, then actually as an institution, unless the whole group defaults, you've handed the risk over to them. Uh, that is potentially unethical, <laughs> right? In, in, but it's only unethical to the extent that, um, and I think this is where it really comes down to it, to the extent that you're forming groups that are not healthy groups, right? That you're putting groups of people together that you know inherently one person in that group is likely going to default and that you're taking advantage of people's ignorance. The fact is that even poor people are really smart about their money. <laughs> And they generally will not let anybody into their group unless they know that that person has a high capacity to repay, right? They're going to say, nah, I'm sorry, your cousin drinks a little bit, doesn't go to work on time, they're not going to be part of the group. So that's, that's a, it's been a very useful tool. Now, coming back to why it's expensive to do a small loan, why is it potentially beneficial then to put a group of people together besides the risk? Bigger loan size, right? So now I'm processing 40 of you all at one time, as opposed to having to process you all individually. And in fact, it's the group that's doing the work. So that allowed microfinance institutions to effectively do small loans, but manage it through groups. But it still required this massive use of human beings, right? So a credit officer had to travel, and still has to travel, by the way, and if you've ever if you ever get to any one of our countries and you want to shadow one of our credit officers, send me an email. I strongly encourage you to do it. You're going to get on a motorbike, or you're going to get on a really janky bus, or you're going to walk a really long way. Um, but you have to go really long distances. And you go out to a really remote village, and you have to sit there, and you have to spend an hour with your group talking through the loan process. You have to do that sometimes on a weekly basis, sometimes bi-weekly, it depends on the country that we're working in. Um, it's a highly, highly manual process. And back in the day, by the way, every single time you signed up a group, you had about 18 pages of paper that you had to fill out. Whether it was a new group or a renewing group, you still had 18 pages of paper that you had to fill out. And frequently, the loan officer would go back to the office, right, and get back to the office with a stack of paper like this. Everything has to get data entered. That was once we had computers. Everything gets data entered, and then you realize that there's pieces missing. So then you have to go back to the village and get the missing pieces. So from the beginning of the loan process to the end of the loan process, and I mean to disbursement, it frequently took 22 days. It's a long time, right? That's actually when we got good. <laughs> So that gives you a little bit of perspective kind of on, on how that functioned, but it was the only game in town. There were a couple of other games in town, so money lenders for sure. Um, and frankly, traditional money lenders have always been, in, in many, many communities, actually a really good source of financing for people. Um, they get a bad name because there are certainly some of them that take advantage, but there are lots of them that are great. Um, there are also, have you heard of Roscas and Askas? So um, they're rotating savings and credit associations. Essentially, it's a group of people who gets together and pulls their money. And there are various ways that that money can be distributed, but it's an informal savings group um, that uses that money and, and distributes it around the group and then pays it back with interest and accrues a larger and larger pot. Or credit unions, right? But those are kind of the basics of available. Any questions so far? Thoughts, comments, are you bored? Yeah. 
No? You sure? Because we can go any direction you want. I, I have general talking points, but... Okay, so, um, we've talked about... Uh, we haven't talked about credit history. And I think that's the other one that we probably need to talk about. Um, credit history. So, the other key piece of how you guys get access to credit, how you have all of these financial services available to you, is that you have a credit history. Poor people don't have a credit history, right? So building that credit history with microfinance institutions is a really important thing because people then need to be, can go to a bank and say, actually, I have done all of this and now I am credit worthy and I can take a larger loan if they have that larger loan size. Okay, so what can technology do for us in that context, right? You, you've heard all about the, how bad my microfinance operations are. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, we hit a wall as an institution. So we are one of the largest microfinance institutions. Um, I had left Finca. I came back to Finca. There were 15 of the 23 subsidiaries that were losing money. Um, there was huge pressure on interest rates. The cost of funds was going up. And don't forget that most microfinance institutions are funded by debt. They're not, they don't have deposit-taking licenses. So the money that you earn between the money that you borrow and the rate that you charge is actually pretty slow, right? And the biggest expense that you have is, besides cost of capital, is what? People, right? It's bodies. So... Technology eliminates bodies. <laughs> we looked at our business and we said, okay, hang on, wait a minute. We actually came at it from a totally different direction, just for the record. Um, we came at it because we said, the customer experience is terrible. We started asking our clients, what is the biggest factor for you in deciding that you're going to take a loan from any institution? Now, I know every single person in this room, if I ask you the biggest factor, okay, somebody raise their hand and tell me, what's the biggest factor for you in deciding whether you're going to take a loan? Yes? Um, I, I wouldn't say loan necessarily, but the... Really? The least amount of paperwork was the one I Totally shocked me. Okay. I thought you were going to say, yeah. Interest rates. Interest rates, right? So... Took a higher interest you did. Yeah. Okay, so that actually makes you one of my clients. Because, because what we found, no, honestly, what we found was that um, most people needed money fast. And the speed of the disbursement was an overriding factor um, in, relative to interest rate and everything else. So, now I'm going to tell you a little story. Okay, so, and this has exactly to do with the speed and the interest rate question. Um, so, I, I'm an avid TED Talk watcher. Are you guys, do you do that when you like, you know, you like, you're like, oh, I really want to finish this project, but I'm just going to watch one TED Talk. And it kind of inspires you, and you start thinking differently, and you're like, okay, it's totally worth the distraction, right? Okay, so one of my TED Talks um, was this experiment, and they were talking about um, the fundamentals of human nature. And uh, they went into an audience, and, and I actually was thinking about doing this experiment with you guys tonight, but then I thought, well, if it turns out wrong, I'm going to look like a real idiot. So I'm just going to tell you the story instead. So they went into this audience, and they said to half of the audience, I think that's more or less the story, and forgive me if I take liberties with the TED Talk, but I watched it a really long time ago. But they said to half of the audience, okay, two weeks from now, we're going to give you a choice between an apple and a bar of chocolate. And so people thought about it and thought about it, and they wrote their answers down. Okay, so what do you think those people chose, the two-week people? No. Oh, hey, they all chose, the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them chose an apple. And then they went to the other half of the audience and they said, right now, I'm going to give you a choice between apple and chocolate. And everybody was like, duh, I want chocolate. <laughs> this is credit and savings. Everybody in the world wants to believe that in the future, they will make a better choice. That in the future, they will repay that higher interest rate fast. But right now, they need the chocolate. 
And sometimes you really do need the chocolate in that particular moment, by the way. But everybody wants to think that their behavior is going to be very different. And the fact of the matter is that human beings are wired to want chocolate. And so when we think about credit and savings, and when we think about what we're making available to people, um, that speed question becomes super important, right? Because what you know then is that people are actually really vulnerable to the fastest player in the market. So when we talk about the perils and the pitfalls of technology, well, certainly the benefit is that I can actually now make a loan in one minute in some of my subsidiaries. I have the technology to do that. I, okay, and I'll get through some of the other, some of the technolog technological tools that we use. But we have the capacity to make a loan in one minute. People are totally indifferent to the interest rate. And so when you look at what's happening right now in East Africa, and Kenya is a really good example, um, there is an explosion in nano loans, right? You guys have heard about nano loans. They're very small loans, like $10, $20 loans. They are at ridiculously expensive interest rates. And people are taking them to buy beer. <laughs> they need the chocolate. <laughs> to gamble, right? They need the chocolate. Um, there's no filter that's happening there that's actually protecting people from that impulse. And now I'm sounding paternalistic. People in development frequently do, right? We do, because we're like, we want to do something good. But the truth of the matter is that there is a social responsibility around financial services. And if we don't acknowledge that and actually take it seriously, we end up, well, with what we have here in the United States. So let's talk about that for a second. So we have great technology here, right? You can go on rocket loans. You can apply for a loan. You can get that turned around. I once got a $50,000 loan in one day. I was like, how did that happen? Just go in your machine, and all of a sudden that happens, right? OK, 100% financial inclusion in the United States, more or less. There are a couple of gaps that we know about, particularly immigrants who don't have credit histories, but it's more or less 100% financial inclusion. 41% of Americans cannot come up with $400 in cash. Not on a credit card. Not in their savings account. Did you know that? Yeah. 41% of the people who live in this country cannot come up with $400 in cash. Does that not put the fear of God in you? What does it mean? What does it mean? I guess people are not financially literate. People like chocolate. For sure. People are, because they can't make ends meet, right? Okay, so there's a certain percentage of the population that's just really poor. That's the truth, right? And a lot of people don't want to talk about that, but it's a fact. <laughs> and there are people who work in two, three, four jobs living with multiple families in an apartment, and it's just really hard to make ends meet. But 41% of the American population is not that poor. There is a culture of indebtedness in this society that is extraordinary. I think I have this written down somewhere. Hold on. Because uh, I, I, I love these kinds of statistics. Um, right, the average American has, OK, guess. How much does the average American have in personal debt? This does not count student loans, by the way. Yes. 38. 38,000. That's a lot of money when you consider how many people live on less than $40,000 a year, right? So, um, so we have created this system where people have access to all the chocolate that they want. And we haven't done a very good job of making sure that they're actually educa educated about the risks of what they're taking on, right? And yes. I have a question. Does that 38,000 um, I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nope, excluding home mortgages. Oh, excluding. Yep. Okay. So it's just yeah, it would be much higher, yeah. Excluding home mortgages. Okay, so this is just on consumption. Just to credit cards, yeah. 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 Yeah, cars probably, things like that, yeah. No, it's a great question. I'm glad I wrote it down. 
<laughs> um, so let's see, what was I saying? Yeah, um, there is a need, I think, fundamentally for us to put people on a diet, right? <laughs> to say, how do, you, how do you make it harder for people to have access to credit without limiting the choices of how they use that credit? Because that's where it gets really gross, right? If you tell people what they can and cannot do with their money, no. But, but actually making it harder for people to overspend m might not be such a bad thing, right? So when we start talking about technology, the question is, so let me get into the mechanics of what we're doing at Finca a little bit. And how am I doing on time? I'm good? Yeah? Okay. So basically what we decided was that we had to digitize our business. And um, we separated it into two phases. So we have very classy names for our phases, Finca 2.0 and Finca 3.0. <laughs> Um, yeah, which is really imaginative considering that we're talking about all this Im innovation, but I think we were just tired at that point, so we said, okay. So Finca 2.0 is about building the rails inside the bank using digital. So what does that mean practically? Well, historically, all of our scoring was done by a credit officer going out with a pen and a paper and collecting a ton of information and making an informed decision based on the inventory turnover or the assets of the family or whether or not they had a toilet in the house, um, whether or not they could repay the loan, right? Um, now we have moved to what we call credit decisioning. So credit scoring, credit, does, who knows about credit scoring like in some detail? Yeah, okay, so credit scoring algorithms can actually be really complicated, right? You have to have a lot of very clean data in order to run credit scoring algorithms. We live in a world where there's not a lot of data. <laughs> so um, we had to come up with a way of making credit decisions without necessarily having complex algorithms. And so we have credit decisioning. So first of all, for clients who are good repeat clients, we basically automatically approve their loans. That was a terrifying moment for us, by the way, because we used to make all of our clients go through the exact same process. And then we started looking at the quality of all of the loans that we made below $3,000, and we realized that none of them ever defaulted. And we were like, so what if we just approved them automatically? <laughs> and, you know, everybody kind of did this, and it was amazing. None of them default. So we pretty much automatically approve loans below a certain threshold. Um, now, there are some knockout factors, but, um, but, but still, for any renewal, it's a very smooth process. So that took a ton of expense right out of the system right there. And then we started employing credit decisioning. So we do have some credit bureau information in most of the countries that we work in, and so we were able to employ that to really speed up the process a lot. And then we started taking the credit officer's responsibility in terms of doing all of those calculations away, and we developed call centers. And so we gave our credit officers tablets, and they go out into the field, and they fill in the information, and then it goes automatically batched back to a central unit that makes all of the credit decisions. So that's taken a ton of time out of that process as well, because imagine, you know, I was telling you before about the credit officer who goes, collects all of the paperwork, comes back, and then he realizes that something's missing. Well, we can do it live right there while that person is standing there in front of the client. They fill in the thing, they send it in, and it goes, ah, you're missing a piece of information. And so they can collect that right away. So it's, it's made it possible for us, even in places um, where we don't have a direct link to the credit bureau, where we don't have a national ID system to reduce the processing time from 22 days to one day. Um, and in cases where we have all of the direct linkages and we can do all of the KYC on the spot, um, we can literally make a loan in one minute for loans up to a certain size. The other thing that's really helped a lot is relationships with mobile network operators. Um, so this is both good and bad. <laughs> So telecoms companies, as it happens, own almost all of the data in the developing world <laughs> because everybody has a mobile phone. Um, and the, the data that they have, as a general rule, meets the KYC requirements um, for very small loans. So do you guys know what KYC is? KYC is know your customer. So as a bank, if you want to make somebody a loan, 
you have to be able to verify on some level who that person is. So I don't know if you've ever tried to wire money to somebody in the United States, and you have to have a lot of identifiers, right? Because they want to make sure that you're actually sending money to a legitimate individual and not to a made-up person. Um, and so you have to, as a financial institution, collect a certain amount of what we call KYC, which do not confuse with KFC, um, information to, to verify that customer. The truth is that most of the MNOs, the mobile network operators, the tele telephone companies, they have all that data. And so what that means is that we can go and if we partner with an MNO, we can tap into their data and automatically verify the identity of that client because they have a unique identifier, which is their phone number, and we have all of their particulars. And because we have the history of their bill payment, we know exactly how much they've been paying for their cell phone bill on a monthly basis. And <laughs> that means that we can predict how much they might be able to take in a loan. So we're able to use that to make an initial loan to a client, convince them to open an electronic wallet. Once you have somebody opening an electronic wallet, then you can do one of two things. You can say, okay, you deposit a certain amount of money into this wallet, and I'm going to use that then to, as collateral, essentially, right, against the loan that I'm going to make to you. Or you can track the transactions that they're making in and out of that wallet. And what that does is it actually gives you a pretty good idea of their cash flow. So then you can start to make larger and larger loans to those individuals just on the basis of that data. All of that is fantastic, right? I mean, first of all, do you realize how cheap that is? I have agents now, um, so mom and pop shops, basically like the bodega around the corner, or they don't have bodegas in DC, but um, corner stores, right? The corner stores. You can go into any corner store in Kinshasa and there will be a Finca agent. We have a POS terminal. You can use your fingerprint and you can make a deposit of $1. So you don't have to get on the bus and pay a buck fifty to go make your deposit. You can walk across the street and you can make your deposit in 30 seconds. Double bonus. In the middle of the night when the branch is closed and you need to take your child to the hospital, guess what's open? The bodega. And you can go across the street and you can withdraw your money and you can take your child to the hospital. So even when we've been in situations where there's been like terrible political unrest, um, we've had to close our branches. Our employees haven't been able to travel. The corner store is always open. Have you ever seen a closed 7-Eleven? No. And so it's like we have this extended branch network that our clients can use, and it's really convenient for them, and it's really inexpensive for us. All of that is fantastic. There's one more added benefit, which is data, and it's good and bad. Okay, so... We now have the capacity to collect all of this information on our clients, right? We can, we can track what they spend their money on, when they spend their money. <laughs> um, we can actually know when they're most likely to respond positively to a request to make a payment. So we have the smart SMS messaging that we're using now. So we can figure out if I send you a reminder at 2 o'clock in the afternoon that your bill is due the next day, and every time I send it to you, you're like... <laughs> But if I send it at 10 o'clock at night, you always respond positively. I'm only going to send you SMSs at 10 o'clock at night, right? So there are a lot of really cool emerging, it's not really AI, but smart tools out there that enable you to really work with your clients and understand them better. And that means you can offer them products and services that meet their needs a lot more closely. And that's really, really exciting. On the downside, because there's always a dark underbelly to all of this, right? People are, they want chocolate, right? So the benefit of our business, the real asset that we have at Finca is that I have 10,000 people in the world who work on my team who sit face to face with our clients every single day. And if I am sitting down across from you, talking to you about credit, we're looking each other in the eye there's a connection that's there, right? There's a sense of responsibility. If you go back to the US regional banks 
um, during the savings and loan crisis, actually. It's really interesting. So they were the ones that fared the best. And the reason that they fared the best, they were more conservative than any other financial institutions. They'd never been very, very profitable. Um, but they were very conservative because they had to sit next to their clients in church every Sunday. <laughs> Those were small communities, right, where people knew each other. The credit officers who worked for Finca, they know all of the people that they're serving. There's a sense of responsibility there. But what happens when you take a loan from Rocket Loan or some other institution, right? So they're not looking you in the eye to say, are you sure you want to take this loan, right? There's just a, an algorithm on the other end. And um, the, the worry is, so how many of you have signed up for something recently that had terms and conditions attached to it? Okay. Did you read them? Not a one. You wanted the chocolate, right? You're like, let me scroll to the bottom of this thing and click, I accept as fast as I possibly can. It's just the way we operate. So the question is, as we move to mobile technology, which we have to do, because there are still 1.7 billion people out there who do not have access to responsible financial services. And I would argue that even though we've achieved good progress in inclusion, we have not achieved good progress in impact. Um, we have to figure out the next step, which is actually, how do you get financial literacy back into the equation in a meaningful way? And that is not a simple question because I'm going to keep going back to the chocolate analogy. People want chocolate. They don't want to have to go through the extra steps. So you have to figure out how will people best learn? How will they best accept the fact that you're asking them to go through an additional step? And my fundamental belief is this. I think it will take time. I certainly know that we will have a much narrower group of clients than we could possibly have. We could absolutely carpet bomb the world with free you know, access, right? But we'd be doing the wrong thing. Um, I think that we are going to build, and we're going to continue to build on the legacy of the institution that we have, um, a group of clients who know that even though it might have taken a long time in the beginning, they knew what they were getting into. And as a result of that, there's a bond of trust. And truthfully, I think that when you look at how women and men differentiate between financial services, women take a lot longer to make decisions about the providers that they work with. But once they've made that decision, they tend to do all of their financial services with one institution. Um, so Finca, interestingly enough, started out serving almost all women. We moved to a portfolio of almost 50-50, and now we're seeing that trend creeping back up. Um, and I think that that's got to be a real focus for us as an institution because um, I don't want particularly to make it easy for people to get chocolate. I want for them to really benefit long term from the financial decisions that they make. I'll stop there and see if you guys have any thoughts, comments, questions. I ran a little over. Yeah. Just the difference between the clientele and your customers bank services? Um, so in some countries, not a lot. Um, Grameen tends to be even further down the poverty line than we are. So we operate as um, actually regulated commercial institutions in most of the countries that we operate in. So we, as a result of that, um, had to attract deposits which meant that we had to go up market in terms of the clients that we were working with. So our core t clientele is still people who are you know, very much bottom of the pyramid, but uh, Grameen has been strictly focused on really serving the bottom end for a long time, and they do amazing stuff. And BRAC, like the ultra poor program at BRAC is another really great example of, but they subsidize that, you know, and they have to subsidize that. And we are actually a for-profit entity. Um, we have shareholders. My shareholders spank me every quarter <laughs> because they, they want their returns, um, even though they're socially oriented. Um, and so we have to, to really you know, have a fine line of uh, doing the right thing, but making sure that we're sustainable. And just before we keep going, I do have a mic. So cool. if, you would like, well, if you would like to ask a question, um, I will give you the mic so we can all hear everyone. 
Hi, my name is Caroline. Thank Hi. you for coming and talking to us. Uh, you mentioned about financial literacy, and I was just wondering what are your thoughts on how to change the culture or introduce it to educational system, especially perhaps secondary or even yeah. um, middle school here? Yeah. Um, so I actually did a lot of research on that at one point um, because I was really interested in kind of how, how do we go back and change the culture here in the United States. Um, so I will say in the countries that we work in, we actually do a lot of financial literacy advocacy and we go into schools and, and do trainings. It's not nearly as broad based as I would like for it to be. Um, in a couple of our countries, we've actually produced books um, around financial education. Um, so in the U.S., you know, they used to do PSAs on TV. Have you ever seen those? They're really cool. Um, uh, they used to do PSAs on TV around the fact that you should save and not borrow and, you know, don't go buy your first house until you've accrued all of this money. And then, of course, um, basically the economy started growing only because of consumption and they were like, well, we can't talk about that anymore. <laughs> so um, so the, the print got smaller and smaller. And now, of course, you know, you guys saw what happened when the Fed raised rates, right? It was like <laughs> this little, you know, storm happened. Um, and, and I think that we had to be very worried, actually, about the long-term implications of that. Okay, so to get to your specific question, um, there are actually a number of programs that are geared at delivering financial literacy in the United States. Here's the problem. It's decided on a state-by-state -state basis. You cannot actually mandate a federal program for financial literacy. And until we lobby to make that change, we will not have any cogent approach to how we deliver financial literacy. From my perspective, it should start in kindergarten. Every child should get a passbook. They should understand what it means to save. Um, and they should have that basic education provided to them. It's part of, and I mean, we teach people all kinds of things, right? Why would we not teach them that basic skill? Um, but, but I think it has to start with getting it in, into the, the federal curriculum um, because doing it on a state-by-state -state basis is totally impossible. And that's why it's been so fragmented and nobody's really been successful in developing it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vijay. Uh, just uh, a little curious about your model. Yeah. Um, you currently serve the lower middle segment, not the real BOP, yeah. you know, not the middle class. So uh, do you do both business as well as consumption loans? Or? We do. Okay. Yeah. And in some cases, you really can't distinguish between the two, I suppose. Well, yeah. I mean, so that's actually a great question, and I, and I love it. So, you know, for a very long time, there was this narrative inside the institution that we only did business loans. Okay, but the truth is... You don't actually know, right, what somebody's doing with a business loan. We're talking about very small loans. And so the fact is that people were taking business loans because they had the cash flow in their business to support it, but they were using it for consumption purposes. And my feeling was, why are we forcing our clients to lie to us <laughs> about what it is that they actually intend to use the funds for? We should be doing straight consumer lending, but only to existing clients. Um, I don't really want to do consumer lending for non-business clients because that's not the core competency that we have as an institution. However, now that we're moving into mobile credit, it's, it's impossible for us to distinguish whether somebody is taking it. So, you know, you can set certain criteria to say this is a business owner, but it really is a pure consumer credit play. So that, that's where the shift is happening. Okay, uh, my question, uh, just on that note, is because we, I'm, I'm, I'm currently advising uh, a large um, small producers association in uh, Nicaragua. Oh, uh, they I was do just micro talking about Nicaragua, yeah, yeah it's a they disaster. Do, they do, uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> what it is now, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, they do microcredit uh, to farmers and a whole host of other things apart yeah. from microcredit. Uh, I'm curious to understand in your model if you've attempted to also bring in financing of small assets yeah. as against just giving a loan out. Yeah. And what has been, say, the difference in repayment behavior? Have you observed any significant difference in repayment behavior? Um, well, yes and no. So in, um, in some cases, we certainly, I mean, we certainly finance, you know, small assets, absolutely. But um, if you're talking about a leasing program, yeah, 
Um, no, and um, the truth is we, we had a couple of really bad experiences with that, where we ended up with warehouses full of white goods that we couldn't do anything with. Um, and so we made the determination that that was actually not something that we wanted to specialize in. Uh, we have a couple of our subsidiaries that still do it successfully, um, but as far as like a general business model, no. Yeah. Because we're actually building a technology platform to do all of these services. Good. For the uh, small farmer community. Well, I think, I think the value chain piece is very different, you know, and, and so, um, and I, you know, again, that is a fundamental business model question, right? There are a lot of people, particularly in Africa also, talking about, you know, how do you, how do you finance the whole value chain? Um, that actually terrifies me to some extent because the risk embedded, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's certainly necessary and there's a ton of uncaptured value, right, that you can get out of the system. And if you don't, if we don't close that gap, then those value chains are never going to be really worth what they could be. And, and the, the truth is that it's the producers who suffer the most, right? So I'm 100% with you. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> Great. Let's go ahead and take maybe one or two more questions. So if you have one, just go ahead and make eye contact with me. Um, I'm going to go with Dylan since he's closest. <laughs> uh, you were talking about the kind of listing off the things that we all have access to. Um, and my question was, what, because I'm actually not uh, familiar enough with your organization, um, what do you do you in terms now. of... I am now, for <laughs> sure. Uh, in terms of the things like insurance yeah. and the other supporting mechanisms at the bottom besides yeah. just the access to a business and or consumption loan. What do we offer? Do you, do you do. have subsidiaries that kind of work in tandem with each other, kind of surrounding those communities to offer these different services kind of in connection with one another, or do you... Is it just sort of standalone and you hope that they find these other things in the process? No. Okay, so um, the limiting factor is regulation. Um, and so uh, in places where we have the ability to do it, we offer deposits, we offer payments, we offer remittances, we offer insurance. Um, it, I absolutely feel that this full suite is necessary for people. Um, credit is actually the worst thing that you can give people in a lot of cases, right? But you have to be able to give people credit because they need it. Um, but, but those other things are the things that actually give people the cushion so that when they do fall off, you know, they don't fall all the way off. Um, we are experimenting with health insurance. Um, we do have cre credit life. I call it death insurance, right? Credit life is, you know, a, a very common insurance that a lot of financial institutions provide, but really all that does is it makes sure that if in the event that you die, your family is not responsible for paying the debt back, which, you know, is not terribly helpful to you as a borrower. So um, I, I think you have to offer all of those things, but in a lot of cases, um, regulation prevents it. So we've been working really hard, and, and this is where you, probably too much information for you guys, but um, to do all of those things frequently, uh, you need a full commercial banking license. And the cost of regulation under a full commercial banking license is very, very high. Um, microfinance institutions, as a general rule, um, have a much lighter touch from the regulator and don't have to comply with as many regulations. So um, th that's, that's kind of the challenge. The other piece is the minimum capital requirements for a commercial license are, are ve you know, very, very different, right? So for an MFI, you might be able to open your doors with as little as $300,000. Um, but for a full commercial banking license, and like, here's, this is one that'll make you laugh. So Armenia, right, tiny country, $60 million for a commercial banking license. I'm like, who in their right mind would pay for a commercial banking license? You're never going to put all of that capital in there. You're never going to make enough money to pay for it, right? So it's basically saying, if you're here already, thank you very much. <laughs> and otherwise, you know, Gesundheit. So, um, you know, those are kind of the issues that are an obstacle. Now, what's exciting, though, and this is where, again, coming back full circle to the fintech, which is what I was supposed to talk about, um, is that there are a lot of non-traditional financial services providers who are coming in now, and um, they're breaking down a lot of those barriers. So um, I don't know if you guys have heard about BitPesa, for example. So BitPesa is really cool. Elizabeth is an amazing CEO. 
Um, and she is using blockchain in order to make remittances available. Now, she still has her hands tied to a certain extent because she can only operate in certain places. She has to have a license in order to do that. Um, but they're able to do remittances for a penny a remittance as opposed to what people are traditionally paying, which is like a 20% fee. Um, and so those kinds of things are eating up the financial services industry. And this is where I get really excited because, um, yeah, it could mean the death of my institution, but we're trying really hard to be on the front edge. And it's these large financial institutions that have been charging people, you know, thousands of percentage points to use the pipes, basically, right? It's plumbing. Um, they're they're going to lose every penny that they've ever made on payments. You know, every merchant that you know right now pays transaction fees on every time you swipe your card. That's going to go away. Right? It's, it's going to be virtually free. And so banks are going to have to figure out other ways to survive. And I think that's the most exciting thing of all in a lot of ways. Because um, it means that financial institutions actually might turn more towards advisory services and really trying to help people use their money effectively. Because the plumbing is just plumbing. And to me, that's, that's the most exciting thing about what's happening with technology right now is, is that we're just great, everybody has the same plumbing, and now we can get on with the business of actually helping people to do good things with their money. Great, so I'm gonna take one last question. Uh, this is a very quick question. Yeah. So what's the percentage of the rural population versus sort of like the new rural migrants that you serve in urban areas? I, off the top of my head, I honestly couldn't even possibly answer that question, but I will say that, um, uh, the bulk of our clientele is still rural and, yeah, and peri-urban. Um, but um, particularly when you look at Africa, you know, um, people are just leaving the countryside and, and coming in. Um, and, you know, the other piece that's, of course, really scary is the demographic in terms of the age. Um, because we have just increasingly a very young population with no jobs, yeah, um, and so that, that's, that's the next big worry is how do, you create, how do you create youth employment? Now the cool thing about microfinance, right, is that it's self-employment and, and there are still a lot of opportunities for people to create their own jobs, but you know, I, I say this to the classes that I teach, you know, so we take all the people in this room and I give each of you, you know, $20,000 and I say, go start a business, how many of people are gonna succeed? Right? It's really hard to be a business owner. And so um, we also need to acknowledge that the, the financial services and the access to money, you know, the, 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 it's a little bit of the like, American mindset, right? Of like, well, anybody can make it if they just have capital. But, you know, that, that's not true, right? Um, people need education, they need support, and they might not be entrepreneurs out of the gate. They might just need a job. So. Done? <laughs> She's like cutting me off. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone has any other questions, please. Sure, yeah. So um, in Latin American Caribbean, we're in Haiti, Nicaragua, Guatemala, um, Ecuador, and who am I missing? Uh, Honduras. Um, then in Africa, we're in Zambia, Congo, Malawi, Tanzania, which I'm going next week, um, Nigeria, I'm good. Sorry, I ha it's like naming my children, right? You know, I actually, I call my kids by the cat's name, so the fact that I can do this at all is actually really impressive. Um, and then we're in the Caucasus countries, so in Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, um, Kyrgyzstan, and Kosovo, weirdly enough. I know, it's like an outlier, but... Um, oh, in Tajikistan. I forgot Tajikistan. Did I name all 20? Yes, you did. I think, so thank you. Okay, yeah. So it's a really, it's a huge, it's a huge geographic span. Um, I'm on the plane every other week, um, which I love and hate. I love it because I love traveling. I hate it because most of the time I'm in economy class. Um, <laughs> but uh, you learn to sleep in really strange positions. Um, no, it's it's actually. It's actually my dream job. I wouldn't do anything else if I were given the choice. And I think that right now is the moment to be in this space because we have an opportunity to do something really great and either we will succeed or we will fail spectacularly. And either one of those outcomes is okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much.